And we are back with episode number 20 of Clubcast, the official podcast of the Diamond Club. And now we are entering a brand new year, 2024. Um, This is pretty much, I put out a tweet the other day, third year anniversary is coming up for the Diamond Club, the website. And we're taking Club Class all the way to the new year as well. Um, Episode 20, I mean, not many people get multiple episodes in, but we're going to continue going on that grind to give you at least a weekly episode, hopefully. Um, But yeah, we do have a few things to talk about. The MLB offseason kind of hit a standstill just because of the holidays. That's to be expected. Most guys are taking their vacations, getting spending time with their families, and now we're starting to get up to where uh, you know, there's only six weeks until spring training. You know, it's already January, February. That's when pitchers and catchers report. And then baseball season's pretty much getting rolling and getting going here. Um, but yeah, there were a few big things that happened over the uh, the break. Um, but first, before we get into that, Jake, how was your holidays and how was your new year? And it was the same as normal, missing baseball. Uh, it's it's crazy. Like, like it says there, six weeks almost until, you know, Things start to ramp up again. Uh, new year. We'll have some more baseball moments to talk about soon. Like you said, we're t- trying to do one every week. So, uh, yeah, just, you know, in the swing of things again. Yeah, it is a new year. So clean slate across the board. I know the Dodgers definitely need it. I was with you when the Phillies lost. I know they definitely need that clean slate now, too. Um, so pretty much day week zero of the new year, every team still has a chance there is six weeks left of the mlb offseason for all these teams to make moves and there's a lot of free agents still out there a lot of marquee free agents however we've talked a lot about the pitching market especially with yamamoto snell uh let's take a look at the position player market and arguably the best position player left on the market is a guy that you wrote about the guy that i'm a huge fan of and that is cody bellinger who is still yet unsigned to a team um there's a lot of reasons why but i kind of want to get you to break down your article that you posted on the diamond club kind of breaking down his free agency why is it still stalling this long um and any other things that you want to add to uh bellinger yeah cody bellinger is an interesting guy i mean a guy who was you know on the top of the world a few years ago in that 2019 mvp campaign and then seemingly fell off was not tendered by the dodgers in his final year uh, so we got that one year deal out in Chicago, which he kind of bounced back, had a really good year. Um, 307, 881 OPS, 26 homers. Um, earned he's gonna earn a big paycheck, but that's what, like you said, about his market, it's kind of been falling apart. Um, Scott Boris, Boris Core, obviously, always in the mix with things. Um, just I think overshooting his value hoping that the market would play along with it, um, having guys like Otani out there, Yamamoto making all this money. But it's hard to compare people to Otani. Um, so that's where the problem comes in. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're overshooting him. Um, there was rumors of demands for $200 million, which is kind of crazy. And then, of course, the reports of them trying to compare him to two of the best players in baseball, and Bryce Harper and Corey Seager, which obviously he's not. Um, but, you know shooting for the moon there um, with throughout the off season, though, there's been a few teams in on him. A lot of teams went and made their moves. I, again, probably a reasoning of, okay, if this guy's going to ask for $200 million, we're not going to wait around it and, and worry about that. Uh, the Yankees made a move for Juan Soto early in the off season. Uh, the Blue Jays look to be done. We don't know, um, but they did sign Kevin Kiermaier, resigned him. One of the diamond club boys, ten and a half million dollars, one of the best fielders in of all time. And then, of course, um, another one was the Red Sox. The Red Sox went and got Tyler O'Neill, which is a guy that we advocated for. Um, so he could really have a bounce back year this year, getting out of that that mess that is St. Louis. Um, but you still have a few people left in. Uh, obviously, the Cubs are the big one. Formed a lot of camaraderie out there. It looked like he enjoyed the city. Um, it is a big city, so I don't think it really is that much different um, for him in terms of like the LA market and all that kind of things that he enjoyed out there. Um, One would be San Francisco. Uh, Obviously San Francisco is in need of a heavy left-handed bat, really any left, any power bat uh, left on the market because they have all their pitching, but not really any explosive hitter since I don't even know Buster Posey, somebody like that. Uh, So that's obviously 
a team that's still in but have made a lot of failed attempts at signing people over the last few years. Uh, we know the Arson Judge incident and, of course, Correa uh, last year. But one other team that is kind of interesting to think about is the Mariners because the Mariners are another fun team that need a big bat, uh, preferably a lefty bat. And having an outfield with Julio Rodriguez and Cody Bellinger um, would be insane out there in, uh, what is it, T-Mobile Park now. Was yeah. the old progressive field, all that. So um, you still have some teams on. Uh, I think the market's diluted. And, of course, him being the last player out there um, that's really of the higher caliber, um, towards hitters at least, will uh, keep his value up a little bit. But, you know, it's just a weird – it's an interesting – depiction of how agents can also kind of mess with your market too and not just help you um in terms of aav and and long-term deals yeah i mean i agree with pretty much everything you said you know especially in the article you wrote kind of highlighting uh like season the highlights for him his stats um kind of shocked that he still remains unsigned but i do think it is in large part to what you said, you know, Scott Boris is looking for the best deal out there. I mean, me and you joked off air about like the, the report that went out there that he's looking for a deal well North of 200 million. Um, I'm not sure there's many teams that are willing to give him that type of deal. Um, I, I kind of compare his free agency to to Blake Snell's free agency, because I Mm -hmm. feel like those two players are identical uh, with each other in terms of what player are you going to get? Because, you know, like I'm a Dodgers fan, so I kind of seen seen Bellinger at his highs. I've mm-hmm. seen Bellinger's at his really lows. And another team that can attest to that is the Rays and the Padres with Blake Snell, where you know we saw Blake Snell at as his very best last year and in I believe 2018 or whatever year he won yeah. the Cy Young for for Tampa. But he's also had a lot of bad years thrown into there as well. So um, I think that's why teams are hesitant to go ahead and say, you know what, let's give Cody Bellinger that seven, eight year deal to $200 million because it has a lot of the, the it has a lot of the baggage that say, Hey, you may look at this deal in the next five years and say, yeah, this team, what were they thinking? Why did they give Cody Bellinger this amount of years, this amount of guaranteed money? So um, I do think teams are hesitant on that. Um, but if you look at his season last year, he did have a really good bounce back season. You know, those 2021 and 2022 seasons, he sh- would sure like to forget a lot of that. I will I will kind of create an excuse with him, especially in 2021, where he battled multiple injuries. You know, he had that shoulder injury that he suffered in 2020 that he had the surgery on. Then immediately after that, when he's getting in his groove, he fractures his fibula and is out for another X amount of weeks to that. I've written an article kind of highlighting about how that those injuries kind of messed with his swing because he got used. He still was taking active swings when he was injured. So he got into a habit of saying, I changed my swing this way because it doesn't cause me pain. And Mm -hmm. that I mean, for anyone that plays baseball, even like as low down and when you're a kid, you know, if you're in pain and you change your game, that's going to change everything about your swing and the way you and your performance on the field. So, um, there are a couple things that I look at, you know, we've talked about it on the bleed Lows podcast where a lot of Dodger fans really want Cody Bellinger to come back. And I would be open to it if it was under the 200 million mark, but I still don't think he's coming back there. But in terms of like baseball savant, his barrel percentage and his um, hard hit percentage and his exit velos were all in the blues. They were in the low either 30th or 20th percentiles, which is kind of concerning because, you know, he did have a batting average over 300 at, I believe, 305. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was a lot of stats were saying, yes, he got a little bit lucky with some of these hits. Can he replicate that and take it to the next season? We don't know because, you know, sometimes luck goes your way one year, doesn't go your way the next year. Um, I'm kind of interested to see at this point. I imagine he's going to sign in the next like probably two to three weeks because you don't want to keep delaying it and and then not know what team you're playing for um, come spring training. Um, I'm kind of interested to see where do you think he goes and can you give like a picture of the deal that he gets? I don't, I think the problem is going to be the money. I don't think it goes north of 200 million. Um, I, I got to guess the Cubs. I mean, it just seems like the most fitting fit for him. Um, they seem like they would, even in the beginning of the season, they were willing to pay him. But I think even with all this, you know, Scott Boris shit that's going on, that might be like, hey, 
you know, we're here. We never left, you know, all these, we think the, all these other teams are going to give you 200 million and you go to them and they're like, okay, no. <laughs> so now you're coming back to the Cubs, which they could get, you know, 175, maybe 180. Uh, I think that would be the easiest guess for me. Yeah, I'm actually going to agree with you. Um, I think the Cubs are the likely candidate. I mean, I've seen at the beginning of the offseason, I threw around, hey, maybe he's going to go to the Giants. It really doesn't seem like the San Francisco Giants are going to go that route um, and overpay for Bellinger. Um, A team that I think will end up meeting that asking price just because I feel like they are desperate is the Cubs. Um, because I feel like the Cubs need Bellinger a lot more than Bellinger needs the Cubs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about how the Cubs were supposed to have a really big offseason. You know, they 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 signed Craig Council to that massive deal for a manager, $40 million. And that's they've pretty much been silent ever since that. So fortunately for the Cubs, Craig Council's playing days are long over. Um, and they really need an impact guy. Because if you really think of the identity of the Cubs, yeah, you could say Dansby Swanson, but he's only coming into like he, he was only there for one year. And do we ever, did we ever classify Dansby Swanson as a superstar? No. Have we classified Bellinger as a superstar? Yeah, we have. He's won an MVP and he's shown flashes of that greatness last year. Um, so I actually think they're, they're going to end up overpaying for him. Cause I really think he, they want him to stay in Chicago. Um, I'll say he probably signs a seven year deal, probably around 200 to 210 million, somewhere in that 28 to $30 million um, AAV range. Um, it would shock me that he gets over 200 million, but I feel like once more position players like Teoscar Hernandez and these other outfielders kind of get off the board, the Cubs may be desperate enough to give him that type of deal because, you know, it's similar to the Harper thing. You know, I feel like people wouldn't have bought Bellinger memorabilia on the Cubs because they knew he was only there for that one or two year deal that he signed with. Um, if you get into a seven year deal, well, there you go. That's your guy that you're marketing. You're going to sell jerseys. You're going to sell bobbleheads. You're going to get people. I mean, Wrigley is usually packed year in and year out, regardless how good the team is. But now you give them extra incentive to say, Hey, uh, we're bringing Bellinger back. We're going for it one more time. Uh, let's bring it all back. So that'd be my ideal thing. So I'm kind of, I've kind of figured we were going to agree on the same thing. If it's not the Cubs, I seen that he's linked to the blue Jays, but I really don't see them making the move either. <sighs> I do like the idea of the Mariners, but yeah. I really just feel like it's Cubs or bust if in terms of the deal that he's going to get. I, it just – it makes sense. I just feel like it seems a lot like the Correa thing last year that Correa said, oh, I'm going to go, you know, shop the market and get this big deal, and then nothing worked out, and then he went back home, you know, for what was kind of expected. Uh, I think that just seems more of what's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, that that definitely is a possibility. So it's going to be an interesting couple weeks to watch Cody Bellinger's market. Uh, Mm -hmm. A team that's been active the past couple, pretty much all offseason, has been the Phillies rival, the Atlanta Braves. They have been making trades left and right, kind of buying high upside players from teams like the Mariners. Um, And now they kind of make their, I guess, big trade of the offseason, acquiring Chris Sale um, from the Boston Red Sox. They are sending over their young prospect, Vaughn Grisham, in the deal as well, who pretty much kind of didn't really have a spot, especially after the season. Uh, Arcia had it short, um, and they were kind of training him to go kind of shag balls in left field. So um, I feel like, you know, it it, it seems like a f- even, even trade. It could be a win-win. Um, you as a Phillies fan, uh, what are you taking away from this deal, especially from the Braves' perspective? Uh, obviously, I'm going to be a hater because the Braves. <laughs> but no, I just I, we love Chris Sale. I've always loved Chris Sale. It's he's a top end guy when healthy. Um, you know, he's getting older, but obviously he can still perform. I just think for this Braves roster construction, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, last year they had three guys who threw over 100 innings, and they had 27 different guys pitch out of the bullpen. I just I, I think you were looking for more of a guy that could pitch a lot of innings. Uh, I think that's why, you know, you see them go after these guys like Nola and they went after Sonny Gray and, and guys like that because they could get the length out of them while also getting high end stuff. Um, obviously, I, I don't think Vaughn Grissom is that big of a loss for them at all. Uh, so it's really just a you know uh, low risk, high reward kind of, uh, kind of move. Uh, I just think if I'm the Braves, I'm looking for more of a, you know, 200 inning guy than a guy who – could not even throw a (laughs) hundred necessarily. Yeah. I kind of agree to that to an extent. Um, 
I would say if it was the Chris Sale of old, then yeah, like this is a guy that's going to be your one or number two starter. Um, the way things are lining up now for Chris Sale, I think it kind of favors him, especially where he's at in his career, where he's not going to be that one, two, or three guy if he's not fully healthy. He's going to be settling into that fourth or fifth spot in the rotation. Um, I think the biggest thing about this is in terms of roster construction in the future. So the big part of the deal getting sent on, the reason why I think whether Chris Sale is good or not, is that the the Red Sox are sending over almost all of the contract that he's owed for this season. Uh, $17.5 million of the $27.5 million that he's he's due for 2024. And then he has a club option for $20 million um, in 2025, which depending on how good he pitches – could be a bargain for Chris Sale because, you know, we've seen Chris Sale at his best. He can be one of the best left-handed pitchers in baseball where he's making some of these guys look absolutely silly, especially left-handed hitters. Um, I really think it, it goes on to say, hey, we're going to bank on him coming back, having a good year, and then possibly picking up his option because if you, you don't know the Braves roster like that. One of their biggest impending free agents is Max Freed, who is also a left-handed starter, where there was reports today from Jeff Passan, where basically they said that he is not signing an extension there and they are prepared for him to walk in free agency, which has been rumored probably past three mm-hmm. years now. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's a contingency plan for the Braves, you know, cause say you get the Chris sale of anywhere close to of old, you probably will pick up that $20 million option. Uh, cause let it make no mistakes. Uh, the Atlanta Braves are not a small market club. They are still spending money. They have a payroll that is estimated to get to, I believe 260 million, which would be like third or fourth in the league. Um, so they are spending money. They are not afraid to do that. Um, they, and Chris Sale, I still think, is a great get. Um, Vaughn Grisham, like you mentioned, I mean, yeah. I mean, when Braves fans were telling me he was the second coming of Christ after Dansby Swanson decided to go to Chicago, and it ended up not working out. I mean, Orlando Arcia ended up winning the spot and having a better season than Vaughn Grisham had. Um, obviously, second base is taken by Albies. And then even the outfield, you look at the what the Braves have, there was really no spot. It was like, hey – I guess go play winter ball and learn some outfield. So um, that's where you're going to be going. And the Braves trades that they got, you know, they brought in David Fletcher. They brought in Kalenic. That's likely mm-hmm. going to be their left field, right field combo right there. Um, so Grisham really had no spot on this roster. And you pretty much send him to the Red Sox where he'll have an opportunity to probably start, whether it's at the infield at second base or maybe he moves into the outfield. Um, if they want to continue that as well. That's why I think it's like a win-win trade for both sides because say neither of these players work out, well, the Braves are only paying like $10 million to to Chris Sale this year, and then they could just decline the option next year. And then Grisham, you know, you're just taking a – he's still on his rookie contract, so you're just saying, all right, we could DFA him, we're, we could just pay him that little league minimum salary and then cut ties with him later in the line. So um, I definitely don't think it's a big trade that a lot of me- people made it out to be, but it does have the potential to be huge come October, especially if the Braves and Phillies meet up again, which I've explained to you, I really think this is a move to counter the Dodgers left-handed heavy lineup and the Phillies left-handed heavy lineup. Um, so it's kind of going to be interesting to see how both teams, especially the Phillies, um, which we'll get to next, what they're going to do the rest of their off season. Yeah, it's it, it doesn't really matter for the Braves because, like like we said, they're only they're not losing a ton of money and they're only losing Vaughn Grissom. But I just I think it's like a settle. I think they 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 missed out on all their guys. Uh, obviously, we heard the cease rumors, stuff like that. Uh, Nola Gray, we Yamamoto, we talked about them. I just think that. It's it could have been worse. <laughs> like they could have got somebody better. Yeah. And I I think this is just kind of they they probably tried to package Grissom and other things into for one of these guys and make a trade or something like that. And then nothing happened. So they end up with Chris Sale. But like you said, it, it doesn't matter if he comes in and you know strikes him out and then playoffs. So that's all that matters. Yeah, that's true. Well, the Braves have been busy this offseason. The Philadelphia Phillies have kind of gone into a deep sleep since they re-signed Aaron Nola. I want to get your takes because you're the Super Phillies fan. I want to kind of get your ideas of what they've done this offseason, where they're going to go for these next six weeks, and then what would you personally like to see them do? Uh, Because I'm on Phillies Twitter too. I see a lot of different opinions in terms of who they want to go after, 
Do they want to give some guys an extension? But we want to hear Jake Huber's predictions, scenarios, all the in-betweens about it for the Phillies. Nobody wants to hear that. (laughs) Um, No, man, I'm not one of the guys who were like, hey, this is, you know, a failure. Like running this team back is like the dumbest thing you could do. Uh, Obviously, it was a team that made the, you know, the National League Championship Series and was one win away from the World Series two years in a row. Uh, I think the things that kind of switched my mind a little bit is yeah, the, the moves from the other guys. Uh, you know, we all expected Otani to the Dodgers. Did we expect Yamamoto to the Dodgers? No, no. Uh, Hater, is Hater going to the Dodgers? Is Hater going to one of these other teams? Um, you know, Braves are making moves. All these things and, and for these competitors, it's like we said earlier, it's not about the regular season. It's about setting yourself up for October and, you know, having that, top end talent even if it's not going to give you that you know full season length is important um so i think i think there's three real major areas that the phillies are lacking on um the first one is that fifth starter uh obviously chris sanchez was you know incredible last year i think he had a close to a three era if not a sub three era uh really broke out for the phillies down the stretch um but i just don't want to have to trust him Uh, You know, last year we had uh, Lorenzen out of the bullpen. Um, We had these other guys who could also, you know, fill into that sixth spot or that fifth spot um, if we needed to, if if something collapsed. I think the sixth man is probably a better idea with Chris Sanchez as he's worked out of the bullpen a lot. So he's a left-handed reliever who who worked out of the bullpen a lot. So I think I've been speaking on Twitter. My main target is Shota Imanaga. Uh, dude's a dog. I, I, you know, watching the <laughs> championship game on my birthday, uh, watching him dice up the United States uh, was not very fun. But he reports today that his contract is going to be somewhere around the hundred million dollar mark, which is you know nothing nowadays. I think we paid seventy two for Taiwan Walker last year, which yeah. Not well, that also not to cut you off. Yeah. I don't know if you saw it, but in an article by Jeff Passan on ESPN, apparently the Phillies offered. Yamamoto, three hundred million dollars, and yeah. he ended up like so. They still, if they're throwing that number around, what's a hundred million dollars to Imanaga? That's what I'm saying. I, I don't. That's why my feeling kind of flipped too, because you're not like obviously they're they're not sitting on their hands. Like it's it's they're trying to get better too. Um, so right, a hundred million dollars for Imanaga is nothing. Um, of course, he's he's not just a this year guy. He's a down the road guy. So that's that's kind of where I would go with the money. Um, we talked about it. The other thing, I'll just roll it all into one is the bullpen. Um, back end closer, high leverage guy. We don't have enough of them. I mean, last year we had Jeff Hoffman in high leverage spots. Uh, Kirk Green's got stuff, but you can't trust him yet. He's too young. Um, so you have really have Alvarado, Sir Anthony, if he's even Sir Anthony, because he had his struggles last year. Um, so I think if Imanaga doesn't come, we've talked about it. I need the Beaver in Class A trade. I need it. I, I spoke Class A into existence. I need him on the team already. Um, but if, you know, Bieber's been shot for years, uh, Dave Dombrowski hasn't made his real, you know, splash trade like he normally does. Uh, so, you know, I think that would be the route to go. I think Class A has got to be a priority either way. Um, again, another high leverage guy, a guy who has closer experience. Um, obviously, Alvarado's not going to pitch to the 174 ERA that he had last year. But we, we need – you know, at least I got seven, six, eight, ninth inning guy. Like that's that's kind of how bullpens are made. the The matchup, the matchup bait system that Rob Thompson uses, obviously has been working. Um, but at the end of the day, you need a guy that can get three outs. So that's that's kind of the second thing we would go after. Um, and then if, obviously we have to address left field. I think left field is kind of a problem. Um, I love Rojas. Uh, he would probably roll or slide to center field with Marsh to left if he was starting. Um, but I don't think you can trust him through a 162 yet. Um, obviously, we saw his videos where he's, like, jacked now, like, pumping. I don't know what he's doing, but uh doesn't mean he can hit the ball. Um, so <laughs> I think uh, the two guys that we talked about them both, uh, Whit Merrifield and Adam Duvall, one of them need to be out there and, and probably left field at least, if not, you know, a, addition of – Jock Peterson or some kind of another lefty out there to platoon because you can't platoon Jake Cave in the major leagues because he's not good. So that's kind of the three areas I need addressing. Um, 
you know, there's other guys out of the bullpen too, probably just arms. Um, Cause I'm, I was doing an article about Connor Brogdon um, earlier and honestly he can make the bullpen, which I mean, he's a good pitcher, but do you really want those guys in the bullpen, you know, come late in October? Um, so, you know, you have guys like Hector Neris still out there. I don't know how much they're, they're wanting to spend on that. Um, but, you know, Jordan Hicks is obviously a project, but could work with a guy with Caleb Cotham. We have a lot of fireball ballers out of the pen. So a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. And then um, I'm with Jack Fritz, man. I'm on the Jack Fritz train. Give us Robert Stevenson. Uh, from the Rays, he's a dog. I don't know how he how he's still a free agent, all star last year. So uh, those are really the three areas the Phillies need addressing. Right now, I'm still comfortable. I mean, this team's probably a 92 to 95 win team easily uh, with the bounce back year of you know Trey Turner and a full year of Aaron Nola, um, full year of Bryce Harper. So things need to happen <laughs> if they want to really be a top contender, but I mean, they were ranked fifth in the power rankings today. So uh, you can take that as it is. Yeah. I definitely agree with a lot of the things you said, you know, me and you pretty much have a very similar baseball mind. Yeah. Um, and obviously I'm not a Phillies fan, but you know, we both live in the area. Uh, me and you talk about baseball in general, the Phillies do come up um, and they're one of the national league contenders now. So as a Dodgers fan, I just feel like it is my obligation to look mm-hmm. at the uh the competition out there in, in our league. So, um, yeah, the Phillies, I think they do need to figure out something with left field. Um, obviously, with Bryce Harper now able to finally go into that, like we haven't seen Bryce Harper in a full 162 in the field and batting in like, what, three years? Like 2021 was like the last time we've seen that. Yeah, so exactly. that's a huge step right there. Um, and then – the, the ability to take Kyle Schwarber and make him the DH, at least for the full time of the season, is is big, on, in my opinion. I think Nick Castellanos has definitely made huge strides in the outfield where he is serviceable out there, especially in right field or left field. Um, if you could swing a trade or something for a dependable like like glove quality in right field and move Castellanos to left, that kind of solves your left field problem right there. But as it stands right now, I do like the combinations they have right now. But I do think they do need to add a veteran slash hitter, right-handed hitter, mm-hmm. to that to that outfield platoon. Um, you me- you mentioned Duvall. You mentioned Whit Merrifield. Um, obviously, there's a couple other names out there. I mean, if you really want to throw them out there and not care about defense, might as well throw Horio Soler in that in that conversation. Um, Tommy Pham is definitely a big conversation getter right now, regardless. Hopefully you're not playing fantasy football with him, but he can definitely hit the baseball really well. I mean, the Phillies and the Dodgers got to see that firsthand last postseason. Um, and he, he out of all the guys that is on the market in terms of right-handed hitter, because I wrote an article for Dodgers beat about, about the same thing, where out of all of those guys, he is the one guy that could probably start against both lefties and righties and be mm-hmm. fine and at least start like 120 30 games in a season. Um, his career has pretty much his career numbers are pretty much on par with the numbers he had last year. Got a middle 200 hitters, uh, decent OPS against righties and lefties. Obviously, there's a little spike against lefties, um, but he's definitely an option to go there as well. Um, I feel like he's going to be a hot commodity, so um, it really depends on what the Phillies are looking for. Um, I think they do need to kind of get some quality assurance in the back end of that bullpen. I do think the Phillies bullpen is extremely under. I guess you could say they're undervalued. Maybe they're getting some of the appreciation now. Um, if you go two, maybe three years ago, the Phillies bullpen was a huge problem. Um, last yeah. year, Phillies fans, you can hate me. Craig Kimbrell is a good, is a decent loss that you're you're missing out this year. He was a very dependable closer. Forget about the what happened in the postseason. Um, in the regular season, he he made the All Star team. He was the All Star team, the NL All Star team's closer. He had a pretty much a revived career in Philly and now where he's going to Baltimore. Uh, so you have to replace him as well. And at the beginning of the offseason, I kind of linked Josh Hader to them. I feel like hit the way he plays and kind of pretty much s- smells Philly. I don't know what it is, um, but I'm not too sure if they're going to meet his asking price where it seems like he's very adamant about taking that $100 million uh, five-year deal or anything more than that. Um, I do think the Shane Bieber and Class A trade makes a lot of sense um, it would definitely fortify the back end of the rotation where Shane Bieber can now be like your fourth or fifth starter and you feel mm-hmm. fine with that. Um, and then Class A, I mean, there's not much to say about the, the guy. You know, even in his down year last year, he led the 
American League and say I think he led the entire league in saves last year. Um, and you have him for like five years of control, like cheap control for a closer who hasn't even hit 30 yet. So um, I feel like a lot of teams are definitely going to be in on him if he is available. Um, and the Phillies are one of the teams that would benefit the most from that. Um, but other than that, I, I would say another thing is that if you can't get a starting pitcher now, I kind of agree with some of the sentiment. You might as well try to lock up Zach Wheeler while mm -hmm. you can. I'm not going to go crazy and say, hey, let's throw him a seven-year deal out here. But maybe give him something, you know, give him a little bit of a pay raise, you know. I'm not too sure what he's making AAV-wise right now, but I don't believe it's close to $30 million. So why don't you give him like a short-term four- or five-year extension, boost the AAV up a little bit, um, and then have him close out his career with the Phillies. Um, that would just be what I would do just because, you know, like we said, they threw the 300 number at Yamamoto. If they can't get Imanaga or something like that, they're going to need to fortify the rotation, not just for this year, but you want to extend this guy because Wheeler, I, I mean, I've seen a lot already. People are picking him to win the Cy Young. He has been a pretty much a dog in the postseason for the Phillies. Um, I feel like you would want to lock up that guy. Yeah, obviously that's a top priority for the Phillies. I think that's why the Peebers one makes a lot of sense because you only have him for this year. Um, you don't have to resign him. Um, you don't really have to pay him because you're really getting your money out of Class A either way. Uh, so it doesn't really matter in that in that way. Um, also, you have until the trade deadline, man, because like I said, this team is a good team, uh, like a 90-win team, So uh, at least. So it's like you go after what has actually been working instead of kind of guessing on what's working, and you make a move for even you no know, half a season. If you need half a season of a guy like Lorenzen was last year, but maybe a little bit better. Um, that helps. So I don't think either way it would be detrimental um, to the Phillies to go after one now or not go after one now. I just think there needs to be one come October. Um, the one, I'll say it just because I, I figured this out and I want everybody to know that I thought of it first. The Jesus Losardo trade makes a lot of sense, man. Taiwan Walker. Trying to rob him again. Trying to rob him yeah, again. Taiwan Walker gives you a decent starter. They're not driving off too much. Uh, fits Miami. Mick Abel and Justin Crawford, who really is a slap hitter. I, I don't know how. Yeah, I know he's young, but I don't know how to develop. And then other prospects if you needed to be. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense for both teams. Um, like again, we had history of trading, um, like the JT trade. So if it happens, I said it first. If not, then just forget everything that I said. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think the Phillies are well in line. You know, it's similar with the Dodgers and the Braves. All these teams, they kind of have the pieces set already to begin the season. You're going to see a lot more teams revamping their rotation and stuff like mm -hmm. that come the trade deadline. Um, so, and the Phillies are definitely going to be one of those teams, especially if they're in contention where this is their World Series window right now. Um, and me and you have talked off air. I really think the Phillies need to try to compete. Wild card, those wild card rounds are pretty fun, especially at Citizens Bank Park. You were there, but you know what's really good? Skipping that wild card round entirely and just getting straight to a home field advantage in the NLDS. Um, I think the Phillies do want to win this division. I do think they have a chance to beat the Braves because I have. Zero faith that the, all of the Braves hitters repeat exactly what they did right. last year. So pretty much can the Phillies make up uh, – how many wins did they finish with? Uh, like 89, 90? 90? 92. Yeah. 92. So can they make up maybe 10 games to get over 100 to kind of match the Braves who won – they, they won like 105 or something like that. Yeah. Did the Braves match the 105 win mark with the, the stuff they've made this offseason? I'm not too sure. So that will be interesting to watch for sure. Um, but kind of ending it out and closing it out briefly, um, we'll talk about the Dodgers. You know, uh, we had our Phillies talk. We'll go to our Dodgers talk. So I'll ask you this. You obviously after the postseason, me and you talked and we said, you know, the Dodgers are going to have a big offseason because this was just an embarrassing loss. I'm actually surprised myself as a fan because I did not expect all these moves to happen, especially the, that three week period in December where they brought in all these guys. Um, I didn't expect that to happen, but it did. So I'll ask you the question after what you saw last year, do you think the Dodgers and their revamp, is it enough to at least get past the first round and maybe go a little bit further than that? It's the Dodgers, man. <laughs> I don't know if they'll ever make it past the first round again. Um, no, uh, you know, they've done a lot. Uh, obviously they signed two of the 
of the best, if not the two best players, you know, in free agency, Yamamoto and Otani. Um, there's things that still scare me. Obviously, you have some questionable things in, in the uh, rotation and bullpen, um, some injury history. Even the outfield looks a little sketchy. Um, you know, you have Jason Hayward, Margot, Outman, uh, obviously saying that Outman is the best player out there. And, you know, what his second year is kind of crazy uh, with Uki supposedly being the second baseman of the future, um, occurring to Dave Roberts. So, you know, they, they have done a lot of things. They have guys. I mean, you have Freddie Feeman, you have Mookie Betts, you have Shoei Otani, you have, you know, Yamamoto, who was a what, three-time Cy Young or whatever their best pitcher award is over there. Um, Obviously, we're gonna need some things to happen, like Glasnow to come over and be healthy and pitch the way he does. Um, some of these younger guys to continue to pitch how they've been pitching. Um, Walker Bueller to eventually come back and and be back to where he was at. So, I think that they definitely like they did. They definitely will compete. Um, it'll be close because, like you said, the Braves, the Braves are probably the other kind of top team. Um, other than I mean, it's the Phillies. It's been the bit Phillies Braves. Dodgers for, for a couple of years now. So I think the Braves won't live up to what they did last year. They're a very good baseball team, but that was, you know, an historical year. Uh, so I could, I mean, easily, I think they're, they're a top two team. Um, it's just a debate on whether they're the best team. Um, if everything clicks. Yeah. I definitely think they, their checkbox, what they needed to, their to-do list the, at the start of the off season. Number one on that, regardless of how you felt, if you were a Dodgers fan, they had to sign Shohei Otani. They needed to get the fans reinvigorated again. They need to get them reinvested into the team because it does, like, for me, obviously a hardcore baseball fan, it doesn't get old. You know, making the postseason this many years in a while, Dodger fans are spoiled. This regular season winning isn't enough to them anymore. They're not intrigued, you know. Fan attendance has continued to still like steadily stay the same, but they need something that gives a little bit jolt to the crowd. Um, and Otani does that. He's bringing in a whole different ball game of fan base. He's bringing pretty much the entire country over to watch Dodgers baseball, um, whether they're watching it on their TV screens or they're coming over uh, the, the Pacific Ocean and watching it live at Dodger Stadium. Um, and the other thing was just to revamp that entire rotation. That starting rotation was decimated from the beginning of the year all the way to the end of the year where only the only guy that was left from that starting opening day rotation was Clayton Kershaw who ended up missing an extended period of time regardless. And then he ends up getting shoulder surgery that puts him out for pretty much almost all of next year. Um, and he's a free agent right now. So I love Tyler glass. Now I am super stoked that the Dodgers pulled the trigger and get to getting that deal done. I love that deal more than getting Yamamoto just because I've been super ex- high on glass now for years now. Um, there's a lot of talk about his injury history and, and, and all that. Um, but if you look at like career inning totals, especially when he was in the minor leagues, it's a pretty much average base right there. Um, Cause you have to take into account total workload and people who say, Oh, well, minor league innings don't count. You're still throwing the damn baseball. Right. Let's let's get that out there. Um, he pitches his career high in innings last year. So it's only just going to keep improving year on and year out. And you know, that Dodgers pitching lab, I'm honestly going to take bold take and I'm going to go with it because everyone's been sharing their rewards. I think Glass now probably finishes top three in Cy Young next year, um, especially if he can get over that 160 inning count. Um, Because I feel like if that's the case, I feel like a lot of voters don't really look at innings anymore, especially with Blake Snell. I think he won the Cy Young with like the least amount of innings in like 20 or 30 years or something like that Um, for a non-reliever to win the Cy Young award. Um, yeah, I, I really like that signing, and and you can't go wrong with uh, Otani, Yamamoto, all these guys. I do agree with you though. That outfield is a little shaky. That is something that we're actually been we've been talking about on Dodgers Beat and the Believe Those podcast. Where who do you put out there? I mean, like James Altman being your best guy, and he's kind of a platoon bat with horrible numbers against left-handed starters. You know, like I love Jason Hayward, but do I think that? he's going to repeat what he did last year. No, um, they've been linked to a couple names. The one I see most prominent, at least since November has been Teoscar Hernandez, mm-hmm. which me and you've talked about before the dude strikes out pretty much at least two or three times a game. Um, and that's something that the Dodgers, I think they don't need maybe in a regular season. I mean, it's whatever, but come October, you need situational hitting guys, and that just doesn't meet the bill for me. Um, so they still have a lot to work to do, which is surprising because it just feels like, 
we've seen the Dodgers name brought up every week, especially in December where they've been making moves left and right. But that just goes to show you baseball. You can make all these moves, but you're not guaranteed uh, to even move on or be the best team. Um, you mentioned earlier the the MLB, they did uh, post their power rankings. They put the Braves at one. I'm not trying to be biased. I think on paper right now, I think the Dodgers are better than the Braves. Um, I actually like the Dodgers rotation as it stands right now more than the Braves. Um, I'm not going to go glorifying your, your Yamamoto yet. Um, I do think he will be extremely good, um, but I think he will have to adjust to the MLB a little bit. So you may see some regression from mm-hmm. the MVP to the MLB, but I don't really think the Braves rotation is all that. Um, I would even say the Phillies and the Braves are pretty much even um, in terms of like total roster, just because, you know, I'm going to take that postseason success for the Phillies. There has to be something clicking there. The, the Braves are built for the long haul, but the, the Phillies are, I think, as equal or could you argue a better team than the Atlanta Braves? Um, but yeah, I definitely think the Dodgers, you have to agree. I have to agree with you. The top three teams, not even just baseball, the, it, or it just, not even just the National League, but entire baseball, it is the Phillies, the Dodgers, and the Braves, it, it, whatever order you want to put it in. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about because I, I have no faith in the Braves or, or rotation either. Uh, you know, you have a 30 whatever year old Chris Sale, you have a 40 year old Charlie Morin, um, you have you know, unproven elder, you have you know, Max Freed, who's also injury prone, um, and then you have Strider, who has a almost a 40 RA but strikes out a bunch of people. So, I mean, I'd trust, I'd take you know, class now's top end, uh, Bobby Miller, what he showed, uh, Walker Bueller, when he's back, his top end. Uh, I trust all these guys more than I would trust trust the Braves uh, rotation. And then you add in Yamamoto and, you know, the other guys, which it's going to be impossible for the Braves to do what they did last year. Um, Like you said, even if the Phillies can make up, you know, even six or seven games, I I mean, 98, 99, that's way closer. I mean, the Braves are at 104, 105 last year. I, I, I can't see that. I can't see RCA having a career year again. I can't see, you know, Kalenic and, and David Fletcher and these guys having career years, Acuna winning MVP. Uh, it's Matt Olson hitting, you know, almost a record setting home, amount of home runs. I think I like what you said. I think those are the three best teams in baseball. Uh, I think they're better than the Orioles who are also will be a team that will regress um, better than the Rangers. I think they just went on a run, uh, but, but really it's going to be, it's, it's close. Because I value pitching more than I would value hitting, and I, the Phillies probably have the best pitching out of all those teams. Yeah, um, but I, I wouldn't put them as the best team in baseball. So it's it's a dilemma. Um, the the Dodgers they're not gonna lose in the first round hopefully this year. So yeah, um, maybe we'll get in a, uh, our finally get our NLCS in Philly, uh, Phillies Dodgers. So maybe that'll have fun. Yeah, well, that about does it for this episode of Clubcast. You know, not much has happened in the free agent market since we took our little break, but we definitely expect the market to pick up, especially like we mentioned, six weeks. And then we are here in February. Spring training is going on. Hopefully new faces in some new places. Um, Definitely keep uh, up to date with the Twitter page at the Diamond Club Zero, Instagram at the Diamond Club Zero, Facebook at uh, the Diamond Club. Um, and then make sure to follow Jake and myself on Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it nowadays. Um, and then obviously, Jake recently joined uh, Fan Sided for what is it? It's that ball's out of here. Um, for the Phillies fan side network, he has a couple articles posted there. Um, and then obviously Dodgers beat and bleed Lowe's podcast. Um, that's where you can find me if, uh, for all my Dodgers stuff as well, but definitely keep up to date. Um, we're going to get back in the swing of things. Um, hopefully to get at least one episode out each week, um, kind of building up to spring training where, um, we're going to have a lot of, uh, a lot more to talk about, but that about does it for this episode. Um, Jake, anything else before we get out? No, man, can't wait. Six weeks, six weeks till we get to see these guys again. Just watch some baseball. So uh, let's go. Yeah, well, have a good one.